Welcome, everybody. We are thankful for Apple Federal Credit Union for inviting us to give you a presentation today on the value of college, financial aid resources, and understanding the cost of student loans. There will be two of us presenting to you today. We've got Maureen Fagan, who's Director of Business Development from North Reading, Massachusetts, and myself, I'm Thalassa Naylor. I'm Director of Business Development in Fair Oaks, California. And together, I won't even share how many decades of experience we have together, but we've both been in uh, the world of financial aid and student loans for a long time. So hopefully we'll be able to bring you some very valuable information today. During today's presentation, you're going to learn much more than just the cost of student loan borrowing. This session is designed to give you a high level overview on many aspects of the cost and value of a higher education, a basic understanding of credit, information on various types of financial aid programs and a look at both federal and private loan programs. Sally May annually surveys families to determine resources used to pay for college. In our 2019 survey, it indicated that savings and income provide the largest contribution. You can see that that's 43% of how typical families pay for college, followed by scholarships and grants, and then by borrowing and a small portion from friends and family. Keep in mind that these are averages and that individual families will have unique breakdowns. College Board's Trends in College Pricing Study from 2019 indicates the following average costs, which include tuition and fees, room and board, and personal expenses. An average cost for a two-year college, public college, is over 18,000. The average cost for a four-year in-state is about 26,500. For a public four-year out-of-state, it's about 42,970. And for a private nonprofit, it's 53,980. Again, keep in mind that these are averages and you may find wide variations by state and school. You can usually locate a school's cost of attendance by going to their website. This information is usually housed on the financial aid section, or if you search the website for cost of attendance, you can find this information for each institution that you're interested in attending. Generally, there are two types of college costs, direct and indirect. Direct costs are those that the institution will be billing you for directly. This would include things like tuition, fees, housing and meal plans. Indirect costs are costs that still are required to attend college, but they will be things that you'll pay for independently, so they won't be billed by the institution. This would be things like books and supplies, equipment, transportation, personal living expenses, and housing and meals. You'll note that we've got housing and meals listed under both direct and indirect costs. It will be a direct cost if you're living on campus, so they'll charge you for the dorms and the meal plans. It will be an indirect cost if you're living off campus at home or in an apartment where you're paying for this on your own. So it won't appear in both areas. It will be one place or the other, depending on what choice you've made for your living arrangements for the year. Shifting to some points about the economic value of a college education, this graph from the Federal Reserve Bank illustrates that earnings for college graduates consistently exceed earnings for those without a college degree. You can see from this 25-year chart, um, although you can't see the exact numbers in this chart, it gives you the idea the blue line consistently higher than the yellow line. The blue line is those with a bachelor's degree. The yellow line is a, a high school diploma. To look at the value of college in another way, this graph details lower unemployment rates associated with college and advanced degrees as compared to those with a high school diploma also detailed as a rise in weekly earnings. So to give you some annual figures, this is, this is stated in weekly figures. Um, to give you some annual figures, a person with just a high school diploma earns just under 39,000. A bachelor's degree will bring in an average of about 65,000, and a professional degree will net someone an average of 96,000. Keep in mind, again, these are averages. Some careers will pay more or less, and of course, where you are located, um, within the country or within your state, you may also find variations in income. 
Before we talk about types of financial aid, I want to talk about the most important form that you need to file, and that is the free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA. The main factor in determining financial need is the FAFSA. It is what is used to determine eligibility for all federal student aid programs, and it's also the most official form uh, used for applying for both state and institutional aid. The FAFSA is available on October 1st of each year. Most of the information will come from your tax return. For the 2021 year, which is the year we're starting now, people are using their 2018 tax return. So if you're looking at applying for the 21-22 year, you'll begin to apply next October using your 2019 tax return. The FAFSA is comprehensive and may take an hour to complete. You can do it online at FAFSA.gov or you can use the mobile app. A lot of aid is first come first serve, so it's advised that you apply as soon as you can after October. I wanted to make one comment here before I move to the next slide. In a lot of our presentations, there's a question about um, the information being a year and a half to two years old by the time that you fill out the FAFSA. So um, particularly in light of the situation that we're dealing with right now with this pandemic, people are having ex uh, experiences of lost income, lost jobs, reduced earnings. The FAFSA still needs to be completed using the required tax return year, but if your circumstances have changed once you've filed the FAFSA, you can let your financial aid office know about your changes in circumstances, and they will take that into consideration once they um, make, the de make the decisions on how they're going to offer financial aid. So again, you must use your the required tax form, and if your circumstances have changed, you can contact the financial aid office for additional information on how to address the changes. So filing the FAFSA, I mentioned a little bit about the tax years. You can see in these right-hand boxes for the current year, um, people started applying in October 2019. For this upcoming year, uh, for next year, so if you're a high school senior this year, uh, you'll be starting to apply October 1st. And then um, for the next year, it would be October 1st of 2021. So one of the things you need to do is get all your paperwork in line, make sure you have your social security number or your alien registration number, your federal tax return, W-2s, any records of money earned, bank statements, records of untaxed income, and then you'll also need to get an FSA ID so that you can form uh, uh, sign the form electronically. So this is, again, important not just for federal loans, but for institutional aid, state aid, and many other types of um, awards that you may be able to be considered for. Once you've filed the FAFSA, you can be considered based on eligibility for the many types of aid we'll talk about next. The first category is free money that doesn't have to be repaid, and this is found in the forms of scholarships and grants. So what are grants? Grants do not have to re be repaid, and they're typically awarded on an annual basis. Grants are offered by numerous sources, such as the federal and state governments, colleges, and independent organizations. Some common federal grants that you may hear about are the Pell Grant or the federal SEOG Supplemental Opportunity uh, Educational Opportunity Grant. The Pell Grant is an entitlement, so you, you would, if you qualify for this, you'll qualify for it at any point in time that you apply for any institution that you uh, wish to attend. The FSEOG is an institutionally awarded grant, and it is on a first-come, first-served basis. Another source of free money is scholarships. Scholarships are awarded on a number of reasons, things like academic achievement, financial need, community involvement, organizational membership, sports, talent, leadership, ethnicity, religious affiliation, parent affiliation. There are scholarships for just about every single little activity, talent, interest, experience you may have had out there. Scholarships do not require repayment. They're typically awarded on an annual basis, although some are, are renewable. Um, the federal and state governments offer some scholarships, but the majority are awarded by the institution and by private organizations. 
One of there's a lot of resources that you can look for scholarships. You can look at local and community based scholarships, federal and state agencies. Your institution will have scholarships. You can search their website, look for departmental scholarships. The financial aid office has uh, scholarships in there, uh, usually in their awarding process. Religious organizations, employers, libraries. Um, the most important thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about is your online search engines that aggregate scholarship offerings and allow you to be matched up to scholarships based on your personal profile. Sally May has a very robust scholarship search database at sallymay.com scholarship search. Here are some scholarship resources that you can take a look at. Apple Federal Credit Union actually has a scholarship search tool provided by Sally May provides access to more than 3.5 million scholarships worth 18 billion. FastWeb is another one, Big Future by College Board. These are all really great resources. Um, the nice thing about these aggregated scholarship resources is that they will actually pull all the scholarship opportunities together for you in one place. They've done all the work for you. So you fill out a profile, they will try to match you up with all the scholarships that might possibly work for you, and then it's up to you to take the time to apply for those scholarships. Scholarships do play an increasingly important role in paying for families, with 65% of families said that reporting that they used a scholarship in 2018. Here is a breakdown of where the scholarships came from and how much they're worth. 61% um, of the scholarship recipients said they got, a, got the scholarship from the institution, from the college, with an average amount of a little over 10,000. 31% of scholarship recipients said it came from a community um, resource or, or, or um, private organization with an average amount of about 2,800. And 21% of scholarship recipients said they got it from a state or local government agency with an average amount of about just under 2,900. We have a few tips here on applying for scholarships. Things like being organized, be honest, follow instructions, include strong recommendations, create a lasting impression with your essay. So when you're writing an essay, um, be personal. Don't just talk about the why and how. Don't just say what you did, um, but talk about how you learned, what you learned and how it helped others and the whole experience. Make it something that people are going to be interested in reading. Um, double check your spelling, grammar, neatness, have some people proofread it for you, ask your family and friends for feedback, most importantly, meet deadlines. Um, you can track your scholarships um, through a, you can create a spreadsheet to track them. You can document your accomplishments in advance so that you have that list handy when you're working on applications. Um, make sure you start early and allow plenty of writing time. I'm going to turn the next section of the presentation over to Maureen, and she is going to dive into uh, a little bit more details about exploring student loan options um, and the cost and what you can expect there. So Maureen, I'm going to hand this over to you. Thank you, Thalassa. Okay. Um, so managing the cost of education loans, exploring student loan options. So the first uh, loans that I that we'll be talking about are federal student loan programs for undergraduate students. And you'll hear the terms federal direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans, which are low interest loans for students enrolled in college at least half time. And the distinction between a direct subsidized loan versus an undirect a direct unsubsidized loan is that the direct subsidized loan is a need-based loan. It's based on the information provided on the FAFSA. Um, all students are eligible for student loans. However, based on the information from the FAFSA, there is a determination whether or not a student will get a direct subsidized loan or an unsubsidized loan. And what the direct subsidized loan means is that interest is paid by the federal government while the student is in school at least half time and during their six month grace period. On the other side is the direct unsubsidized loan, 
This is for students that do not show financial need. However, the FAFSA does need to, to be completed for this loan. And um, we, we did hear um, that this is one of the most frequently Googled um, student loan searches. Um, what is the difference between direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans? So wanted to take a little bit more time to describe those differences. And so we're switching to the borrowing limits and interest rates. So there are loan limits on an annual basis for the direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans. And they are as follows, 5,500 for the first year, 6,500 for the second year, 7,500 for the third and final years. Um, and those are limits for dependent students. Independent students might have higher loan limits. Um, there's additional bullet points here for military members may be eligible for special interest benefits regarding their federal loans. Payments do begin for these federal loans after six months after leaving school. Um, we consider it a grace period and um, no payments are due during that time. There are flexible repayment options with terms of up to from 10 to 25 years. And there are deferment options as well and loan forgiveness options. The interest rates are as follows. Uh, it's 2.75 uh, for an interest rate for both the direct subsidized loan and the unsubsidized loan. And there is a fee um, taken off the top of the loan before the loan is dispersed to the college or university. So you noticed on the previous slide that there are loan limits. And so the question always remains, how do I pay the remaining gap? Um, another loan that does require completion of the FAFSA um, is for parents of undergraduate students, and that's the Federal Direct Plus Loan for Parents. And that will allow the parent to borrow the remainder of what a student owes after financial aid is applied. The student needs to be enrolled at least half time. This loan is generally paid back over a 10 year period. The maximum loan amount is the cost of attendance determined by the school minus any other financial aid. The Federal Parent PLUS loan is not eligible for some of the income-based repayment plans that the student loans are eligible for. And the interest rate is higher. Uh, the interest rate is 5.3 for this academic year. And the origination fee is also higher, which is 4.236. And again, the origination fee is the fee that is taken off the top of the loan before the funds are dispersed to the school. What's very important to note for the Federal Direct Plus Loan for Parents is that it is only for parents of undergraduate students. Um, and the student's name is not on this loan note at all. So it is the parent's responsibility for repayment with this parent loan, um, nor can, um, aunts or grandparents borrow on this loan, so it's not for um, anyone else other than the parents. And why I make that distinction is because with private education loans for parents, um, they allow for parents, um, but they also allow um, any eligible credit worthy individual to um, borrow as well. So it could be uh, parents, guardians, or any other qualified person, relatives, et cetera. Um, the following information um, will vary by lenders. Um, the repayment terms can vary from lender to lender. Um, most private lenders do not have any of the origination fees that I, I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, the repayment terms um, are also um, vary from lender to lender. Um, it can be immediate repayment, it can be interest only repayment, um, it could be completely deferred repayment, and the annual loan limits are quite similar to the Parent PLUS loan that I mentioned. It is the cost of education minus any other aid that is received. These loans do require school certification, so upon completion of the application, the school is notified that um, the, the a uh, parent or credit worthy individual has applied and um, the school makes the determination on 
the cost remaining that you're eligible to borrow for. So that's the private education loan for parents. The student would not be on this particular loan note either. So with the PLUS loan and the private education loan for parents, the student is not on the loan note. The next loan program is really the most common that we see. They're private student loans. And in this case, the student is the primary borrower and the parent or other credit worthy individual is the co-signer. And so oftentimes students are young, they have not established credit, so they would often need a co-signer on the loan. Many lenders have co-signer release options so that after so many on-time payments um, during the repayment period, the co-signer can be released from the loan. That will vary from lender to lender as well. So it's very important to do your research on that. Another benefit of private student loans is they help a student build credit, um, especially if that lender does require or um, provides an option to have in-school payments. Um, the student can build credit. Again, this will cover up to 100% of the school certified cost of attendance minus financial aid. There are no disbursement fees generally with private student loans. And again, like I mentioned earlier, many lenders offer the cosigner release option. Um, and then just some final bullets, um, the option to defer or make in school payments. So that's the most common um, private, the private student loans are the most common that we see. Just a little bit more information on the repayment side for private education loans. Oftentimes you'll see the option to make immediate repayment, defer repayment, pay later, have a fixed repayment plan, have an interest only repayment plan, and oftentimes lenders will associate their price or their rate um, to each of these plans. So um, it's certainly worth your option to take a look um, at the lenders, at the variety of resources that they have um, when you're when you're shopping for student loans, private student loans. And then of course, it's really important to consider how much to borrow. You really need to consider your financial situation and you need to consider the earning potential in your chosen field. Um, and a, a really great website to do that research is um, through the US Department of Labor um, to really determine what your future earnings will be. Some other key considerations, again, considering your financial situation, your expected starting salary and debt load, the type of interest rates. There are fixed interest rates with private lenders, and there are also variable interest rates with private lenders. Var variable rates will oftentimes be less expensive in the short term, um, but again, they are variable rates, so it really determines the determination on whether or not to choose a fixed or a variable rate is really um, reliant on how comfortable you are um, with a variable versus fixed. Um, benefit programs that may, might be offered in the student loan programs, um, oftentimes you'll see private lenders as well as with the um, federal student loan program, if you make automatic payments right out of your checking or savings account, um, oftentimes you'll see and interest rate reduction. So that's something to consider. And then the other features that you want to consider that will vary from lender to lender are the repayment terms, fees, cosigner release, and um, what that cosigner release um, eligibility requirement is for um, any lender. And then um, whether or not there are death and disability waivers. So really just talking about the cost of student loans and just kind of backing up a little bit here is the interest rate is the rate that um, a lender will charge you to borrow money and the higher the rate, the higher the total loan cost. Another factor that um, is really important to consider that um, is, is 
really important for any loan that you borrow, but there are some nuances with the student loan programs, is interest capitalization. That occurs when unpaid interest is added to the principal amount of a loan, and thereby it increases the total amount, total principal amount outstanding. And the next slide will give you a little bit more detail on interest capitalization with student loans. And then the other thing to consider are the repayment incentives that I've mentioned before, the interest rate reduction for having automatic payments deducted from your checking or savings account, or perhaps a lender offers a, a credit to a loan balance after making so many on-time payments. So these are things to consider as you're shopping for private student loans. What's unique about interest capitalization in the student loan world is that it often time ha oftentimes happens at the point where you're not making payments and then you go in back into repayment. And the most perfect example is the grace period that I mentioned um, earlier. So students will um, graduate, have a six month grace period with most private lenders. And then at the point after grace, they go into repayment. It is at that point that most lenders will capitalize the interest that's accrued. So it's important to know if you have an opportunity to make in-school payments, it really will save you a lot of money to do so. So um, this chart below indicates um, that scenario where um, an individual um, was paying the interest as they went along um, versus someone that did not pay the interest as um, pay the interest. And it really does shift the monthly payment considerably and the total life of the loan has increased by $3,000. So something to consider um, about the impact of interest capitalization. And then credit management. So when we're when families are applying for private student loans, one really needs to consider their credit and FICO scores. Um, a FICO score is really the most commonly used score um, by lenders. About 90% of all lenders use FICO scores to make determinations on whether or not they will lend to an individual um, and, and at what rate. Um, so it is a three-digit number calculated from the credit individual, from the credit information on an individual's credit report at a particular point in time. So that number will vary, um, and that number really summarizes the information on your credit report into a single number so that lenders can quickly assess your credit risk very quickly. And so oftentimes when you're applying for a loan, Perhaps some of you know through applying for an auto loan, let's say, um, you, the, the results come back very quickly. And that's because, because FICO scores can be used as one of the measurements to assess risk. Um, the FICO scores generally fall within the 300 to 850 score range. And of course, learning your FICO score can help you better understand your credit health. And this slide really provides an overview of the components of a FICO score. 30% is the amounts owed, so your total amount owed with credit. Um, and then 35% is your payment history, so how well you're managing the amounts that you owe. So that's a really big proportion of your FICO score is how well you're managing that debt. And, um, and if that debt is too excessive, that's that's a, a big number as well. So really just being able to manage it from that perspective. The other um, components would be new credit. So if you're applying for um, multiple credit cards, that can really affect your credit score. The length of your credit history. Um, why we require co-signers um, for private student loans is that young folks do not have a length of credit history. So the longer you have credit, um, the, that is considered a, a positive in your credit file. And then the 10% is your credit mix. And what lenders typically like to see 
is um, a mix between revolving credit lines, like a credit card, and see how well you manage those, versus um, a closed-ended loan, like a mortgage or a student loan. Um, so having a credit mix can be advantageous as well, as long as you are managing it properly. And then these are really the scoring bands um, for FICO. Um, 800 plus, I mentioned earlier that 850 is, is the highest. So 800 plus would be ex exceptional. And so those individuals that have such high FICO scores are more than likely to get those lowest rates that any, any lender would offer. Um, so they're well above the average score of US consumers. Um, 740 to 799 is very good. And then you can continue on down um, looking at the scoring bands. Um, so it's really important to manage and look at your FICO. Many credit cards offer free FICO score information. Many credit cards are now doing FICO score simulators so that you can take a look at what if I um, pay more down on a credit card or what if I borrow a loan at this amount, what would it do to my FICO score? So there are some um, pretty neat tools out there to help borrowers manage FICO a little bit more. As I mentioned, um, FICO is used by more than 90% of um, lenders. And so what happens um, with lending is um, a lender will go out to one of the credit bureau agencies, either Equifax, Experian, or TransUnion, and request the FICO score, and the credit report from um, an individual. And so that is the process. The lender goes to the, the credit bureau, the credit bureau goes to FICO. And I'm going to switch it back to Thalassa. She will finish up with some helpful resources. of financial aid and student loans is to start keeping records. So from day one, when you start filling the FAFSA out, when you start applying for loans, when you start applying for scholarships, it's really important to start keeping track of all that information. Keep your documents together, keep them on file, have your promissory notes, your disclosure statements, your offer letters, um, entrance and exit counseling information that you'll be required to do with your loans making sure you open and read your student loan email. Um, some other good things to do would be to bookmark your loan servicers website so that you've got that already in your browser. Um, just some obvious information such as make sure you're notifying your loan servicer of any name and address changes. Um, document your calls to your servicer, time and date of the call, the person who handled them and a general um, summary of what the conversation was about keeping your important numbers available, and consider using an interactive tracking budgeting tool. Um, it would suggest it into its mint.com. So you should have all of your student loan information, but it's always good for you to double check and make sure that you've got all of the information. So to find your federal student loans, in addition to the information that you have saved, you can look up your federal student loans um, at studentaid.gov. We've given you the link here. You will need your federal PIN number, um, but if you have lost your federal PIN number, you can request it again, and we've provided you that link as well. And for private student loans, you can compare the information that you have against the information that the credit reporting agencies also have to make sure that they match up. Here's a spreadsheet idea, an example for how you can track your student loans. Some important information that you need to keep track of is the type of loan it is. Is it a federal loan? Is it a private loan? Is it subsidized or unsubsidized? A student loan, a parent loan? Who's the servicer? 
the servicer contact information, the loan amount, the interest rate, if you have a grace period, yes or no, and how long, and then any kind of action dates that may require action um, in the future. Here are some additional resources for, for students. Your school financial aid office is going to be one of the best resources you have because not only are they going to be fully knowledgeable in federal and state and institutional money, but they're going to have your records, your story, your package, um, and they will be a really great resource for you for financial aid information. Your lender or servicer is great for getting information about your student loan. Um, there is the federal student aid ombudsman. Um, if you have any disputes or, or um, issues, then I want to talk a little bit about federal loan servicers. So when you borrow a federal loan, it is uh, originated and dispersed by the Department of Education. But what they will do is they assign it over to a servicer to manage the loan once they have dispersed it. And that servicer will manage payments, billing, um, anything that goes on with that, that student loan once it's been dispersed. To, to the institution as managed by the loan servicer. You don't get a choice of what loan servicer you have. The Department of Education uses their formula to assign it. The four that we've listed here are the four largest servicers today. However, there are also some additional servicers, Mohila, Cornerstone, Ed Financial, OSLA, Granite State Management Servicing. There's even more than this. So your loans could get assigned to any number of servicers, which is one of the reasons why we um, encourage you to really open your mail, pay attention to your email. You will get notified immediately who your servicer is, and that's the, a very important organization for you to know who you should be working with. In most cases, if you're borrowing multiple student loans, the Department of Education is, is uh, working hard to make sure that you're assigned to the same servicer, but there have been occasions where somehow you get assigned to two different servicers for different years that you've borrowed. In most cases, those servicers will work together to consolidate under one servicer, but you need to get that started by talking to, you can start with one servicer or both servicer and, and, and request that they consolidate your loans under the same organization so that you're not making payments to two different servicers. Um, for information on federal and student loan repayment, you can go to studentaid.gov. As you can see, this website has popped up a number of times. It's a great resource for you for a lot of different things. So something to keep in mind is this presentation is an overview. It's not comprehensive. It's subject to change. And given the events that we're currently experiencing with the COVID-19 epidemic, the Department of Education and the CARES Act recently off passed by Congress may offer some additional repayments if you're in loan repayment or entering loan repayment. So please check the Department of Education website for the most up-to-date information on available options and assistance. And your loan servicer will also be able to provide you with additional guidance. We wanna thank you very much for your um, participation today and your interest in this information. And we wish you all the best of luck as you move forward to pursue your goal of a higher education and in success in finding ways to pay for that in the most affordable manner. We hope this has been helpful for you. We appreciate your time today.